Whenever we see stories of Jesus healing people in the gospel, we always have to keep in mind these stories are always historical, but at the same time, they're meant to be instructional. So certainly, Jesus really did heal the blind, the sick, and the lame. Hopefully, that goes without saying. But at the same time, these stories are meant to convey a spiritual truth, a truth which is necessary for our salvation. And in order for us to understand what these truths actually are, we need to actually walk through these stories step by step, being really attentive to the details contained therein. So they illustrate the point. Think about that really famous story of the healing of the blind beggar Bartimaeus, which you find in the context of the Gospel of Mark chapter 10. So perhaps you recall how that story goes. So Jesus is passing through the city, and Bartimaeus gets wind of the fact that Jesus is actually doing that, as a result of which he cries out to the Lord over and over again, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, the thing I want you to notice here is the particular title that is ascribed to the Lord by the blind beggar Bartimaeus. So again, he calls him Son of David over and over again, which in fact is a messianic title. And in ascribing this particular title to the Lord, Bartimaeus is revealing his working image of God, if you will. So basically behind the whole idea of one's working image of God is this notion that quite apart from what you might profess in church, how do you actually relate to God in the context of ordinary life? And so, for example, how you relate to God in the context of life, does it reveal that you believe God in reality to be an absentee landlord? So God exists, he exists in the heavens, but at the end of the day, he doesn't really care about me, right? So I, I'm struggling through the context of this life and God is just waiting to judge me harshly at the end of time, right? So is that, for example, your working image of God? God. Or in contrast, is your image of God that of the Messiah, the Son of David, the one who is truly the Savior of the world, the one who alone can save you, will save you, and perhaps more to the point, actually wants to save you. Now, what's interesting is that in response to Bartimaeus crying out to the Lord time and time again, again, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me, the people around him basically rebuke him and tell him to be silent. They're, they're basically telling him to shut up. And, and so in this, perhaps you might see a certain symbolism kind of going on, right? So what do the voices of the people around Bartimaeus ultimately represent? Well, you can look at it in a few different ways, right? So perhaps they represent the voices of the world, right? The voices of secular society telling you to put your trust in something other than the Lord. Materialism, secularism, however you want to frame it. Or perhaps these voices are emblematic of the voices in your own hearts. You know, these voices which are pulling you away from the voice of the Good Shepherd and pulling you towards a direction of fear, doubt, and mistrust. Now, fortunately, despite all these competing voices pulling him in the direction of discouragement and despair, Bartimaeus perseveres in pursuing the Lord, right? So again, he cries out over and over again, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Which speaks to a really important point in the spiritual life. In the context of our relationship with Christ, if we want healing, if we want true reconciliation in the context of this relationship, we need to be patient. And perhaps more to the point, we need to persevere, certainly beyond our own comfort level. To illustrate the point, the example that comes to mind is Matt Fradd, this really notable Catholic speaker who speaks a lot about issues relating to sexuality and, and pornography in particular. And basically, he was talking about his own personal struggle with pornography. And so basically what he said is that in, in the early going, when he realized that pornography was shameful and indeed sinful, he was basically looking for the quick fix. In his own words, he was looking for like the silver bullet to kind of uh, destroy or eradicate this, this sinful habit. And so he was looking for something like pray more or, you know, devote yourself to Mary or, or wear a different colored scapula or something like that. But eventually he learned that true healing was ultimately to be found in the context of real work. And so, for example, he had to learn to recognize and then avoid the various triggers which led to his use of pornography. He had to come to understand that pornography is often a, a means to soothe his emotional affect. On top of that, he had to learn that shame, indulging it and giving in to shame, was counterproductive. He had to learn on top of that that freedom was not a final destination as a result of doing X, Y, and Z, but instead was a product of making good choices in the context of daily life. And then finally, he had to learn to share his struggles, to share his brokenness with the people that he trusted, with the people in whose love he had confidence, rather than give in to the temptation to live a double life or, or a false life, if you will. In other words, Matt Fred eventually came to realize that his issues, the problems that he was facing, were really complex. And because they were complex, they required an approach and a solution that was equally complex, which in turn required perseverance and patience in the journey towards full reconciliation and healing in Christ. 
In any case, to go back to the original story, Jesus obviously hears Bartimaeus' cries, as a result of which he tells the people next to him to call out to Bartimaeus to invite him to come to the Lord, right? In response to which Bartimaeus throws off his cloak and runs to the Lord, which is actually really significant and really symbolic. Because you got to appreciate, right, that Bartimaeus wasn't simply blind, but again, he was a beggar. He was a blind beggar, right? And so given all that, his cloak was his most prized possession. It was his most valued form of security before meeting the Lord. And so given all that, for Bartimaeus now to throw off his cloak and run to the Lord is basically the spiritual equivalent of pushing in all his chips, to use kind of a poker analogy, to push in all his chips and bet everything on the Lord with no parachute and no safety nets. To illustrate the point, I want to go back to the example of Matt Frad. So basically in the context of this podcast called Restore the Glory with Dr. Bob Schutz and Jake Kim, Matt was invited to speak to his 20-year-old self, right? So basically as a matter of background, his 20-year-old self, he was struggling with anger and pornography. And the question was posed to him, knowing what you know now, what would you say to your 20-year-old self who again was struggling with anger, pornography, whatever the case may be? And Matt basically said this, First of all, I would hold him. I would tell him he was good. But then I would tell him that the Lord is not scandalized by him. The Lord knows his heart and he knows his desires. But at the same time, pornography, even though it might have served a role back in the day, we have to let it go. We have to say goodbye to it. We need to break up with it because it's not helping. It's actually hurting. And in talking about this, Matt Frad was identifying a really important spiritual point when it comes to the reality of sin. In particular, this notion that what makes it really difficult and challenging to let go of our sinful habits certainly is the habit part, the compulsion aspect, but also this notion that for a time, our sinful habits served a purpose, they served a role, right? And so we had this desire in our hearts, we had this woundedness perhaps, and for a time, these sinful habits soothed the aching heart or fulfilled this need in some obscure sort of way, this limited sort of way. But again, more to the point, this idea of seeking healing in Christ requires that we let go of the thing which served us in a certain sense before in the past. In other words, we need to examine our lives and find within our hearts the courage to throw off our cloaks, if you will, to throw off our formal sinful habits, again, even though these particular habits may have served a particular role in the past for a certain period of time. Now, of course, that brings us to this climactic dialogue between the Lord and Bartimaeus. And so the dialogue begins with the Lord posing a question, as he typically does, right? So what he says is, what do you want me to do for you? Now, in the face of it, this question might seem kind of silly, if not completely stupid, because, you know, imagine you're Bartimaeus, right? You're blind, you go up to the Lord, the Lord poses you this question, again, what do you want me to do for you? If you're Bartimaeus, you're probably thinking some variation of, duh, give me my sight, right? Don't you realize I'm blind? But I think the Lord is actually being rhetorical here. He's asking this question, but it's a rhetorical question. And so in a certain sense, he's making a statement. And so essentially what the Lord is basically saying here is, look, the thing that you think that you want isn't really the thing that you want. It doesn't really coincide with your deepest desires. Like I have no doubt that you want to see, but the thing that you really, really want is something which runs a lot deeper. Because at the end of the day, you got to appreciate that sight ultimately is functional. Sight is meant to be purposeful. It's meant to serve a particular purpose. So yes, I want to see, but for what purpose? Such that I might become aware of my immediate environment, but ultimately such that I might be able to figure out what I need to do, how to live life. And you see in this, the Lord is sort of identifying the elephant in the room, if you will, when it comes to these various stories of healing that you find in the gospel. Because of course, a lot of us, especially in this modern context, we hear about these stories, you know, the story of Bartimaeus and people of his ilk. And our natural response is, that's great for Bartimaeus, but what about me? What about other people in the world right now who are struggling with physical ailments? I mean, it's great to hear about healings in the gospel, but again, what about people who continue to struggle in the context of this world? And in response to that, the Lord is basically saying here, look, the real evil in this world is not a physical thing, but instead is a spiritual thing, is a spiritual evil. It is the spiritual blindness caused by sin. Because what does spiritual blindness ultimately do? It obscures the reality of who I am, what life is all about, and more to the point, where it is I'm supposed to go. As a result of which, I am left feeling empty, sad, and lost. But that, of course, brings us to Barnabas' final response to the Lord Jesus Christ. So in response to the Lord's question, what do you want me to do for you? Barnabas, of course, says, teacher, that I might see. Now, you probably noticed that in the context of certain translations of this particular story, instead of saying teacher, it says master, which is unfortunate because it implies sort of a subservient relationship, sort of a master-slave relationship. 
which kind of misses a really important detail because uh, the word which is translated here as teacher has sort of a, a personal dimension to it. So uh, Dr. Brent Petrie talks about this in a sense of saying that even though it translates as teacher, what's being implied is my teacher, my rabbi, which again has a, a personal dimension and implies a, a personal connection to the teacher who is Christ. And by addressing the Lord in this way, it's kind of interesting, Bartimaeus sort of pulls together all these various thematic elements that we've been talking about thus far. And so in a certain sense, what he's saying to the Lord is, look, I'm a sinner truly in need of redemption, but fortunately you are the savior of the world. And, and more to the point, you are my savior, the one who can save me, the one who will save me, and the one who actually wants to save me. And so given all that, I am fully committed to never compromise, to never settle, but instead to persevere with patience and endurance until I find true healing and reconciliation in your holy name. Because truly I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And in the face of such humility, in the face of such tremendous faith, is it any wonder that the Lord Jesus Christ heals Bartimaeus immediately? As a result of which Bartimaeus is finally able to see his Lord and Master face to face for the first time. And on top of that is finally able to follow him on the way, is able to follow him on the path. The path to peace, the path to happiness, the path to new life in Christ. And may God bless you all.